Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Faith and Prayer. Presented by Jesus on the 11th of May 2013 in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session one, part one. Better turn myself on. Hello. It's been a long time no see, hasn't it? Five months? Yeah, it's been five months since we saw the majority of you last. Welcome today. You're all very well behaved today. I'm impressed. <laughs> It's amazing what absence does, and a bit of uh, self-contemplation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, today and tomorrow, if I just let you know what our plans are today and tomorrow. Firstly, today, we've, uh, the plans are that we talk to you about faith, and we'd like to make it a presentation that involves your questions, so, so we're very happy to answer your questions on the subject of faith. But it might pay to give me at least five minutes first at the start, just so that I can introduce the subject. Um, tomorrow, yeah, <laughs> instead of straight away. Um, tomorrow we'll be talking about the subject of prayer. So today's faith and tomorrow's prayer. So the other two things, topics we'd like to discuss with you today and tomorrow. As you've noticed, there's some uh, media with us today. We've got some fellows from New Zealand, uh, Channel Nine, New Zealand, and. Uh, if you guys want to put your hand up so that, so that everyone can see who you are. Yeah, so there you go. Channel 9 New Zealand. And also we have some guys uh, from Sky News in UK. So, so they're the guys. So that's, you'll see them wandering around a bit. Um, by now, most of you have probably gotten fairly used to the fact of having a camera pointed in your direction. <laughs> at least, um, with our cameras at least. So just relax with that and, uh, and just be yourselves. That's the main thing to do. Today we have, uh, are going to discuss with you a number of other things besides the topic of faith, but we'll do that after the break, actually. So what we're going to do is have a break about two hours in and then we'll uh, have a little demonstration for you that uh, some people have organised of a couple of rap songs. Um, so... Has, have any of you seen... I think we've uploaded some on the net at this point. Have any of you seen them? Yeah. No? You have? Yeah. They are so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and Joy just goes bright red every time I say that. Um, but it is very funny. But uh, they were all done for the Kenya project that, uh, that we were working on over the last few months. We also did... Um, quite a lot of videos while we were, uh, what you might have thought as resting. Um, we, we don't see it as resting, we just see it as doing some different things. Um, and what we finished up doing was uh, probably 60 hours or so of videos in that time, from last time we've seen you to now, uh, which are all, have all been loaded onto the internet, or most of them have. And uh, many of them are discussions about the pageant messages, some of them are discussions about uh, we've even started doing some mediumship uh, stuff that we're recording now, and I don't think you've got the latest one of those on the net yet. And we also have done quite a few uh, discussions and frequently asked questions. In fact, we've done 200 frequently asked questions as well, um, which are different to, many of them are different to the interviews. So we've started up a new frequently asked questions YouTube channel, and the idea of that was to just give people lots of, uh, a list of lots and lots of different types of questions under different types of subjects where they can listen for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 10 minutes, depending on how long the question was uh, answered. And they can, they can easily get some truth in that, short, in that short time frame. So that was the purpose of those. So many of you probably wouldn't have seen those, I would, say, I would suggest. And some of them are worth seeing, in our opinion. <laughs> That's just our opinion, of course. All right, well, let's uh, get started on this topic of faith, shall we? What do you feel faith is? 
Have you given it much thought? You see, the way I see faith is probably different to the way most people see faith. Um, I see faith in every single aspect of our day-to-day life. Most of us have learned faith by the time we're three years of age, in fact. Right? Just not faith in God, but we have faith in many other things. For example, most of us, by the time of three years of age, have some faith that somebody is going to feed us when we're hungry. And why do we have that faith? Usually it's because of the past experience that we have been fed every time that we were hungry. <laughs> Can you see that? And so after a while, we get to the point where we realise that we, we don't need to worry about hunger so much, particularly in the Western world. Now, of course, there's people in other countries who do not have that faith. And the reason why they do not have that faith is because they have not had the experience of being fed every time they're hungry. And because of that, they don't necessarily have a faith that they are going to be fed whenever they're hungry. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Can you see, straight away from that little illustration, faith is based upon what's happened to us previously to a degree. Um, you're three or four years of age and you decide to jump up into the air, right? Now, all of you have a faith that you're going to come down again. Right? Now, you don't know the law of gravity in the sense of uh, understanding it techni technically and scientifically, but you do know it from a personal experience. You know what the law of gravity is going to do. Because by that age, you have now become so used to the fact that every time you jump, you're going to go down rather than up into space. Now, imagine a life where you were worried about jumping for a moment. I can't jump today. I can't jump today. I might fly out into the universe if I jump today. You see, can you see that faith is based upon some kind of law as well? So in the case of the law of gravity, what happens is that we have faith that whenever we jump, we will return to Earth and we know it as a certainty. And the reason why we know it as a certainty is because it is one of God's laws. One of the laws of the universe is the law of gravity. And so the law of gravity will determine what happens when we jump. And we come to trust these laws, these physical laws in particular, every single moment of our lives, without any thought whatsoever. They become a part of our very existence, in fact. Every one of them requires our faith, to a degree, but because we now know it as a certainty, we don't consider it to be faith. Now, if you look at what's happened historically with regard to the law of aerodynamics. Now, how many of you, when you were children, decided that you wanted to flirt with the law of aerodynamics and strap the pack to your back or something like that or tried to jump off a building with something above you that would flare out, hopefully, and catch you by the time you hit the ground? How many of you tried that, actually tried that? All right, so, yep. Yeah. And, and how many of you are men? <laughs> yeah, quite a number, yep. Yeah. That's normally the way it is. Well, I, I used to do that too. I'm very lucky to be alive, actually, in a lot of ways. <laughs> because I loved the whole concept of flight ever since I was a child. And, uh, and so what I used to do was I, I used to get these kites, and I'd make these kites, and then I'd jump out of a tree. And it's fortunate that actually the trees weren't very big where I grew up. Otherwise, I would have probably come to a lot more grief than I actually came to. And I was fascinated too by, by um, balance and, and those kind of things. You, I, I remember seeing as a child the whole concept of somebody doing a tight rope across Niagara Falls. Did you ever see those pictures? Well, I, when I saw those pictures, I was just fascinated. I decided I wanted to be a tight rope walker. And, and so what I did was I got up onto our fence, which was one of those old wooden fences, you know, with wooden slats, about six foot high. And I got out one of my father's bars, which was a steel rod bar that went for about 20 or 30 feet long. And I was balancing with this bar. 
walking along the fence. And of course I fell off and broke my wrist. That's, the, the, um, that's what happened to me. So, like I said, most of us have probably experimented with these kind of things. Flirting with the laws. If you think about the law of aerodynamics, what caused man to decide to try to build a flying machine? Uh, let's have the mic so that Sorry, we can... The birds? The birds, are watching the birds. But most of us, with, when we're little, and we watch it with fascination, don't we? It's like this, this underlying fascination. And inside of us builds this feeling. This feeling starts to develop. Of, oh, I would like to be able to do that. Right? And there's all sorts of reasons why we have that feeling when we look at a bird. Like, for example, we have the feeling of freedom. And many people who become pilots have that sensation where they, where they love the sense of freedom that they feel when, they, when they're piloting. And so we've decide, we decided, historically, many people have decided to flirt with the laws to find out whether there were any laws that controlled flight. Now, obviously, the fact that birds could do it had a huge impact upon our choices. The fact that we knew something had, was doing it meant that we could have some trust that it could be done. And, of course, that makes faith a lot easier if somebody illustrates that it can be done before we actually go ahead and do it, that makes us, or it helps us, have a lot more faith that we can personally do it. Does that make sense, Willie? A bit just down the front here. I wonder if we're influenced by the fact that in dreams sometimes we fly? Yes, certainly. There's all these kind of events that do occur in the sleep state, that when we're asleep, we obviously our body separates from our physical body, and we are in the, in the spirit world in that state. And in, and in the spirit world, we can fly, of course. We can move about quite easily. And so there is this feeling or this desire to do it when we're awake, which, which, which obviously has, in, has influenced mankind for a long time. The, the earliest recorded time in history where man, there was some kind of reference to flight, was in the 1700 years before my first century life. So 1700 years BC. And, and my suggestion to you is that it happened a lot long, earlier than that. But that was the first recorded thing that we actually have a record of now. But if you look through history, you know, we flirted with kites, and then we flirted with gliders, and then we flirted with balloons, and then we flirted with what was called lighter-than-air flight, which was all the balloon-type flight. And then we started flirting with heavier-than-air flight and learning how to control all of that. And this is where people like Whitehead and the Wright brothers and other people like that in history, they, they were flirting with the laws that controlled flight the laws that control the three or four ways in which you, you can manoeuvre a craft. And as they did this, they were building on their knowledge of law. Does that make sense to you? So there is a direct relationship between faith and law. And I'm not talking now about man's laws. I'm talking about the laws of the universe, the laws that govern our very existence. So, for example... If we think about the law of gravity, which most of us are aware of now, and we become aware of at a very young age, that is a law that is a fact. It's a fact. It's one of the facts, scientific facts of the universe, is it not? Right? So the fact is, that every single law that we have tr developed trust in is based upon facts that we can measure scientifically, that we have some kind of justification for believing in. Otherwise, we wouldn't believe it, would we? We wouldn't accept it. Now, the guys who started uh, working on the other law, the law of aerodynamics, In other words, the science, it's all, these are all laws, they're all facts. It's the science of discovering how, what laws govern the manoeuvring of a vehicle that is in the air flying. Right? So are, these are laws all based around facts, things that we actually know. Now, 
we didn't know them at a time. For example, it, it wasn't known until quite recently in, in, in recorded history, it wasn't known that gravity could be measured in terms of its acceleration. So it had a speed and acceleration that would occur um, through gravity on the Earth, and that every mass would have a different value of gravity, depending on the size of the mass. Those kind of things were fairly recently discovered in the last five or six hundred years. And, and it was only by people doing what we now call experiments. That we came to understand the laws involving, for example, the law of gravity. Does that make sense? So if you are against experimenting with your life, then I suggest you're not going to find out many laws of the universe if you do that. And you'll be reliant on other people who are more courageous than yourself, who are willing to experiment. So my suggestion, though, is to have the courage to engage in experiments. Because the more we experiment with life, the more we begin to learn about the laws that govern our life. As we learn the law that governs our life, we then come to see those laws as facts. And once we see them as facts, we have some faith in what will happen in our future based on those laws. So faith isn't this thing that most religions tell you it is. Most religions tell you that you've just got to believe and there's no reason behind it. Or you've just got to accept it and there's no proof when there's no proof. That's what they will tell you. And what I'm suggesting to you, if we look at our physical life, we can see that this is not true. The reality is in our physical life, we have learned different laws through a process of experimenting and finding out eventually that there are facts that involve the process of discovery of law. And these facts determine what we can have faith in in the future. So, so for example, with the Wright brothers, with, the, with their design of their aircraft, they realised that if they had this shape of a wing that would cause more air to flow over the top and therefore be thinner than underneath, then they would create lift. There was the principle of lift. And this was a law that they discovered through the design of gliders before they actually made their own aircraft that was powered. They designed gliders. And there, was many there were many experiments for almost 100 years before they came about that had proven these facts. So from their perspective, building an aircraft was not something that was uh, you know, beyond imagination. All they realised is they understood the law. Now, when they were children, like myself, you remember those little helicopter things that you could buy? I don't know if you remember. They're usually made of plastic with a handle, and you pull the handle, and it spins this blade that's got a certain shape, and all of a sudden the blade takes off and flies around, and then lands. You, you remember those? Uh, yeah, I suppose they don't have these toys much anymore, but anyway, um, this is, I'm showing my age now. Um, but, but you pull it, and off it flies and lands down. And it's fascinating for children to watch all of these laws in action. And so most children, like the Wright brothers, when, at a very young age, when they get one of these devices, they go, wow, this, there's the spark of their interest in some of the laws. And, and in their case, they wanted to discover more about the laws because there were certain things that were not discovered. And that was how to manoeuvre and control flight. So there was plenty of people who were going up in hot air balloons and then coming down somewhere where they didn't necessarily want to come down at some point in the future. Uh, they were comfortable with the whole concept of a hot air balloon flying because of, a, because of the lighter than air concepts, but they didn't know how to control their flight. And, and man, after that point in time, wanted to focus on control of flight. And so this is where a lot of experiments were done by Whitehead, the Wright brothers and others, who were attempting to control flight. Now, the very first flight 
only went for something like uh, nine seconds or 12 seconds, I can't remember the actual figure, and, and uh, they only went for something like 90 feet. Uh, that was a, but it was a controlled flight where they could manoeuvre the craft. Within two years or three years or so, they were flying 20 minutes at a time right, with their craft and flying up to 45 or 50 kilometres in terms of distance. And do you know how far we fly now? Well, we fly all around the world, don't we? And there's, there's aircraft now that have 860 plus passengers flying at 900 kilometres per hour for 15,000 kilometres. Right, so that's that, and that has been made, that transition has been made in just over 100 years. Just over 100 years for their entire transition. But all of that transition was based upon laws and facts. Now, the people who were so-called visionary could, could vision the future of this. So you had people like Leonardo da Vinci, for example, who who would construct or design or draw flying machines. Now, they had, now, this was hundreds and hundreds of years prior to it actually occurring. So they had dreams that it could occur and imagination, but it was not based upon some kind of uh, weird science or some kind of like, disturbed mind that caused them to believe all those things. It was based on what they could observe as facts. So what I'm trying to get at here is that there is a direct relationship between faith and facts. A direct relationship between faith and laws. Now, we haven't on earth always known of the law. And so what we have had to do is we've had to imagine certain things and then try experiments that would determine what the law would be. And then once we measured the results of these experiments, we decided to experiment some more with greater experiments and bigger, bigger experiments, but using the same law. Right? So there was a focus on understanding the law. So the law of gravity, we determine is a law. By the time we're three years of age, we, we are fully conscious of its operation, even though we are not necessarily aware of the intricacies technically regarding the law. So we wouldn't know, for example, when we're three, most of us wouldn't know that the acceleration of the law of gravity is, on Earth is 9.8 metres per second per second. We wouldn't know that. Right? And most of us as adults are probably not that aware of that either, <laughs> unfortunately. You were probably told that sometime in your history when you were at school. Now, we know that because it was me it's been measured, the acceleration of the law of gravity. Right? We know that. We also know that it's developed by the differentials in mass. So we know that if, it, if something's bigger, it has a greater gravity than something that's smaller. And this is why when, we go, when they calculated all the calculations regarding going to the moon, they were aware that they'd be able to make a step and sort of fly through the air a bit before they hit the ground because the mass of the moon is much, much lower than the mass of the Earth and so forth, therefore there is less gravity. And because of the calculations of the relativity between mass and gravity, we can actually work out the actual gravity of any mass. So there's a whole lot of scientific principles and technical principles associated with knowing the law that defines gravity and the relationship between that law and mass itself and the creation of gravity from mass. And of course, we know that every material has a different mass. So if something's made of a gaseous ball, for example, it's going to be much, much lighter and therefore have more, less gravity than something that's made of a solid core that is much heavier and therefore will have more gravity associated with it. And these, can all, these principles can all be calculated. If, in fact, we are still coming to understand gravity. Did you know that? There is still quite a lot 
scientifically that we do not know about gravity. For example, there's the measurements of dark, what is called dark matter, right? That determine gravitational fields. That that that's matter that we cannot measure using any normal techniques, but we know it's there. Now these are all principles where we're still coming to understand the laws of gravity. And of course, it also brings us to the laws of gravity and how it affects light. So how it affects the things we see. It actually curves light if the mass is great enough. Right? So, so the little child who's three, if we just go down that one level of investigation of let's find out everything that we can possibly find out about gravity, by the time there are scientists at 40, they'd still be working through many, many things that they need to know about the for this one single force or law. It's very different knowing the technicalities of something, is it not, compared to actually being involved in its operation. So the child at three is involved in the operation every time it jumps into the air. But it doesn't know the technicalities, how it affects the operation of the universe at that point. There's more things to discover. And so it is with all of God's laws, in fact. All of God's laws are facts, but the more we investigate them, the more we realise we don't know. And that is generally the case with most scientific discoveries. And it's also the case with most of these principles that, that we can discover in terms of physical principles. Now, why have I raised all of that in a discussion about faith? Do you think? Thanks, Jason. I was just getting a feeling of my own soul's gravity and magnetism and how it relates to law of attraction and God's laws and experimenting. All right, you're way too technical for me already. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why do you think I have presented this firstly as an introductory concept to the, to the term of faith, do you think? Alex, in front. Uh, that we gain faith through experience. We gain faith through experience and experimentation, yes. Anything else that we can gain from this analogy? If we go, um, if we come down to Laura here on the side, and then down to Joy on this side. Um, that it's not like wishing on a blind, f wishing or a hope that there's something that exists, like it's a, it's a fact, it's proof, it's a law. So it's, it's not a blind, as you were just about. It's not like a, a wish, a blind wish, or a hope that yes. something exists. So, like it's so faith isn't blind. It's not a wish. It's not a hope. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree with all of those statements. Yeah. Joy. Um, the the fact that it's based on facts, like, um, and so there are so many more observable facts. Whereas I know I've lived my life just in opinions, which is not the same as observable facts. Exactly. So it is very different to an opinion. So th these are all the things that faith isn't. It's not an opinion and it's not a belief. It's not a belief. Mm -hmm. It's not an opinion. Mm -hmm. So there are many people historically who believed that the earth was square. That's a belief. We discovered through circumnavigating the earth that it's round, that's a fact. There's a big difference between belief and fact. So we need to understand the difference. It's no good believing in something that's false, because <laughs> that's not a fact. You, you can have fa People say that you can have faith in something that's false. I don't agree. That's not faith, that's wishful thinking. It's not the same as faith, right? Completely different. And I'm not, I'm not here to encourage you into wishful thinking. That's not what we want to do here, right? So these things, blind, wishful, hopeful thinking, opinions, beliefs, these are all things that are not the domain of faith. Faith does not accomplish, accompany these things. Right? They are all different kinds of qualities, some of which are good. In other words, hope, having hope is a great thing. And some of which are not necessarily good. Like when we have a belief in something that's completely false, it can mislead a lot of our life if we're not careful. So that, that's not helpful. 
So I'm not suggesting to you that you have faith in things that are not based on facts. All right? This is very important to understand. Is there any other uh, things if we go back to Graham and then come back in front of Graham and then down here on the side? Um. I see the, um, the analogy that you're starting to paint. Yep. That in God's universe, he's created all these, or he and she has created all these laws. Exactly. Let's say at the beginning we don't even know if it's a he or a she. No. And we don't even know if it's a God. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If we really start properly. Yeah. yeah. And in my investigation on the scientific side as opposed to the spiritual side, yeah. I found that uh, when I start to investigate the laws, I think you touched on it, that um, you can spend... 40 years just trying to understand gravity mm -hmm. and I have a little um, sort of aphorism that um, everything that God creates is infinite yep. and it's but even that might be a supposition right at the beginning yeah exactly that's just something that I intuitively feel yep. that he doesn't or she doesn't have limits but that again is another is it, supposition. Is an assumption. <laughs> Can it, you see what we do? Yeah. We, we, we often start discussing things, and I know you're getting to a point, Graham, but mm. um, we often start discussing, discussing matters and we make a lot of suppositions, many of which we personally might feel that we have established, mm. but the audience themselves may not have established. The person who is listening to us may not have established these particular things. Mm. And... Can you see with every discussion, unless there is some establishment of factual evidence, it really is pointless to continue the discussion, isn't it? It's, not, it's like saying, you've just got to trust that I'm talking about gravity. Now, with gravity, it's easy because it's a physical thing that we can all experience. We jump up, we fall back down to the earth, we've experienced that in that moment. Ah, you know, obviously, there's a law in place that controls that, and it's a fact that controls it a certain way on earth every single time and that's a fact right and unless we engage another law right which they've actually found you know there were calculations done in the 1800s you know how a lot of people used to strap feathers to their and, and flap and hope to fly well a man a, a, a scientist in the 1800 found that he could make some calculations about whether that would be possible and actually he finished up calculating that it's impossible for a person to strap a heap of feathers to themselves and try to lift their own weight off the ground through the power of their own arms. Through mathematical formula. Every single thing that becomes a fact can be justified through some kind of mathematical or scientific process. Does that make sense? Is there any point you wanted to make though? Yes, so as yeah. we discover the facts relating to these laws... Yep. Um, there's the analogy that we become, we get more faith through experience of those laws. Yes, well, I want to take the analogy of faith a lot further than that, actually, because we want to break it up. So what, when we talk about faith, and this is where I'm leading towards, is we want to see what is involved with faith completely, not just this, discuss, this initial discussion. So what I'm illustrating firstly is with regard to physical laws... Most of us have quite a strong and, in fact, such a developed faith with these physical laws that we know them as certainty. In other words, faith is no longer necessary because now we know for certain that that belief is true. We don't know everything about it necessarily, but from an experiential perspective, we do know that it's true or certain. And we have complete trust in its operation. So much so that we're willing to send people from the Earth 250,000 kilometres away from the Earth to the Moon and back again, knowing that they'll be able to come back. And the, the astronauts who were coming back had complete confidence in the laws, knowing that those laws would bring them back home, as long as they engaged the laws correctly. Now, in their case, they had to engage lots of laws. They had to engage laws about 
what, what they would be able to do in terms of manoeuvring the craft, how they would land on the moon, how they would exit the moon, how they'd land back on Earth. They had to engage all the laws and principles of slingshotting around and acceleration, principles of gravity controlling all of these particular things. There were huge amounts of laws that were engaged in one operation. And yet, we could do it with complete confidence that it was going to come about, it's going, it would be certain. And we're over here next Sunday. AJ, the facts start in your mind, don't they? And then the faith comes from your soul? Well, this opens? is one thing I want to talk about, is that, is that before these laws were discovered, somebody had some kind of feeling, didn't they, mm. that they were able to be discovered, mm. right? And, and so they might not have known the laws of aerodynamics, for example, but they had a feeling that they could be discovered. Yes. They didn't even know all the laws of gravity. They didn't know that the, they could measure it, for example. But somebody had a feeling that that could be discovered too. Yes. Yes. So where did this feeling come from? Right? Mm. Now, these feelings don't just come from our mind. Because there's all sorts of places they come from. Even little children have these feelings. And they don't necessarily have a developed mind enough to engage those particular feelings. So these feelings come from other places, obviously, which let's call it our soul, shall we? Because mm. we don't even know whether we've got one, do we? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> if we really approach the universe around us in a completely, as a completely blank slate, we don't know anything when we begin. And there's things that we learn through the process of experimenting and flirting, if you like, with the laws that are involved. Discovering the laws, mm. that's, that's the key part. Now, there is a relationship between this and faith, and, and then I want to talk about spiritual faith. Now, Graham made a comment just earlier that he felt there was a separation between science and faith. I cannot agree with that. I believe that there is no separation between any scientific principle and faith and spiritual development and physical development and soul-based development, all of them to me are all based upon law. That means they are all based upon facts. Now, if they're all based upon facts, it's just a matter of whether I'm willing to engage an experiment to discover the facts that matters. And if I'm not willing to engage the experiment, then it's highly likely that I won't discover all the facts. But if I'm willing to engage the experimentation process, then it is highly likely that I will discover more and more and more facts as a result. Those facts will lead me to having faith about new things that I didn't have faith about before. And then I have a desire to develop and find out about those facts that govern the operation of those particular things. So I see it as, a, as all aspects of our life are completely based upon facts. And in fact, if it's not based upon facts or reality, my suggestion to you is that it's just an opinion, it's blind and wishful thinking, and it's pointless <laughs> as well. You're far better off not having an opinion, right? Rather than holding on to an opinion that is not based upon a fact. Because often a person who doesn't have an opinion is willing to receive the fact before a person who has a preconceived opinion. And this is a problem that we find with most of our development on the planet. We, we finish up developing a certain process down a certain path and then everybody starts believing that's the fact and that's the only fact. And as a result, we stop investigating. We stop investigating the new facts, the new truths, the, the laws that govern these particular things and when we stop investigating what do we do? We stagnate. Mm. It, not only just ourselves the whole of humanity stagnates in different areas as a result of the whole of humanity having a concept that is fixed in a certain belief system that is not necessarily a fact. Now I'll give you an example of that. There are people today, like the medical profession today, will tell you that, the, and this is the majority of them, will tell you that every physical sickness has a physical cause. And scientists are constantly focused on finding the causes 
of physical diseases so that they can fix them with a physical solution. Right? How many of you are sick? Right? And do these physical solutions, they do help, do they not? Temporarily, many times. But we still grow old and we still die anyway. Um, so that, that, that doesn't seem to be stopped at any point. Although scientists are even working on that now. Like how to fix up that gene that's in our body, the death gene that causes our body to go into this place of not replicating its cell structure properly and, di and dying. They're even working on that because there's physical laws associated with that too. But if we examine all of these physical laws, we are so focused on the physical that we forget that might, there might be, just the concept in our mind, we forget, there might be other laws that govern this. Other laws that we're not aware of that are governing what's really going on. Right? Now, if we're, if we're not a blind person who you know, has a lot of wishful thinking and we believe in things and have opinions about things that might be true or might not be true, and we rub all that out and we stop... We start worrying about all of that, right? Thank you for the board cleaners, by the way. That was really good. And um, then we would be willing to engage in experiments to find out the truth about the matter. However, if all of us collectively decide at a certain point in time that we've already found out all the truth that we need to know about those particular things, or we all believe that such truth is not available at all, then you can see that no one is going to stretch the limits and move into a new domain of law that we have previous, that is previously undiscovered. Now, the reason why I love the scientific uh, principles is because I'm a scientist myself. The trouble is, on Earth at the moment, there's no university that you can get the kind of degree that I'm interested in. Right? Now, the reason why I say that is because I have always, all of my life, been interested in the principles governing the, the laws that control the individual person and what happens to the individual person. Now, I discovered quite early in my life in the first century, I understood these principles. While I did not know that gravity was 9.8 metres per second per second in terms of its acceleration, I did understand the principle of gravity, and I saw that as a fact, as a law. And then I knew that there were laws that we had not yet discovered. But the laws, all of those laws I saw were attributed to the physical existence of man. And I started thinking, what if there's a whole other existences of man? Like, what if there's a spiritual existence of man? And by spiritual, I didn't use that term. I used the term, what happens is when the physical body dies, what happens if life continues on? So we now call that the spiritual, if you like. Life of man. But then I went even further and said, what happens if there's this thing underneath, this thing underneath all of these things that I came up to term the soul, but many people before me had called the soul. So, so my interest wasn't generated by, uh, it all came up in my mind that I thought, oh, maybe there is such a thing as a soul. I just looked at all of the writings that I could read and all the different things that I read in the prophets of the Bible and things like that in the first century and I thought, hmm, maybe there is a soul too and maybe there is a spirit body as well as the physical body and while I knew there were physical laws, it made sense to me that there must also be spiritual laws and there must also be laws that govern the soul. Now that's a fairly logical supposition, isn't it? given the fact that we all are bound by physical laws, it would make sense that if there is a spiritual existence or a spiritual part of man, that there must be a whole set of laws that govern that. And it would also make sense that there, if there is a soul-based part of man, that there must be a whole set of laws that govern that. And so I set about, through my relationship with God, to discover those laws.
Does that make sense? That's a pretty logical decision, don't you think? Right? It's amazing how many of us don't decide to do it, though. But it is a very logical decision. And to me, it doesn't... It, and I know, uh, Rob, you just said courageous. To me, it didn't feel like any courage whatsoever because I just felt like, well, no, I've trusted these physical laws all of my life. Why would I not trust that there would be other laws governing these other parts of us? Of course it makes sense, logically. Right? So there are laws that govern these other parts of us. And it just requires that people set about trying to find them. Doesn't it? Like being willing to undertake the experiments that finish up finding these particular laws that govern them. Um, I could I could accept that if there's physical laws, there's spiritual laws and soul laws, but what I can't get to is how do you go? How did you discover from physical to spiritual to soul? You you know how did you get from there to there to there? Exactly, it's a very good question, and the answer is really simple. I realised that if there was so much law, there had to be somebody who created them. So all of those things told me that if there were laws that governed my physical existence, which I could see in operation all the time, and I could feel in operation all the time, and I could engage with trust, complete trust, and I then assumed that there must be the same for the spiritual and soul-based conditions, I, just, I thought, well, this is proof, and in fact, to me, it is one of the major proofs of the existence of God. Because the theore theoretically, if God didn't exist, then we live in an anarchy-based universe. And in an anarchy-based universe, there would be no laws, theoretically. The fact that there are laws that govern our universe tends to indicate that there was a person who formulated these particular laws. Do you see the relationship? And most people don't see the relationship, actually, I feel. Most people don't understand that if, if, if we are governed by laws that are, that are solid and firm, then why, and in fact in our country, if you think about it, here in Australia, we have hundreds of thousands of laws, who created them? Now they, govern, they don't govern even our physical existence, most of them. <laughs> they are just figments of our imagination, but they do control our lives because we all agree to observe them. In this case, what I observed was that whether we chose to observe these laws or not, we were forced into observing them. So the person who decides to step off a cliff without the aid of aerodynamics found that gravity had its effect. It was an immutable law of God. It was something that would not and could not be changed under any circumstance unless there was a higher law which negated its effect. You follow that? So the law of gravity can, in our case at the moment, a man's case at the moment, the law of gravity can be negated through these laws of aerodynamics. Can you see that? And, and when I say negated, it's not like the law of gravity ceases to operate. The law of gravity continues its operation. But the law of aerodynamics, being a powerful law in itself, can overcome the forces of gravity under certain circumstances. And all we had to do was discover the circumstances. Somebody had to do a heap of experiments, sometimes at the result of the loss of their own life, in order to discover the circumstance. Do you know with the Wright brothers, they were never married. They didn't have children, both Orville and Wilbur Wright didn't get married, they didn't have children. And they made an agreement with their father that they would never fly together. Can you see why? Because they had all this knowledge about the laws of aerodynamics and they, and they thought if both of us die at the same time, then the development of these laws would all be halted or made stagnant. Right? So they decided instead to have one fly one time, one fly the next time, one fly the next time, and so forth. And there was only one time in their entire life where they flew together. And they did have accidents, by the way. Right? There was a time 
a couple of years after their first flights, when uh, I think it was Wilbur um, had a, had a quite a large accident, and he was flying with a passenger, and his passenger died. So it's not like they didn't have trouble in the process of the discovery of these laws and putting them into application. But if you think about it, they were willing to engage the experiments. Now, what I'm suggesting is, it makes sense, if there is laws that govern the physical universe, they had to have came from some source. There has to be something that backed them up, created them. And it also made sense to me that the same source that created the physical laws probably also created the spiritual laws that govern our existence. So the same source. And the same source that controlled our spiritual existence also created the laws that controlled our soul. And so it made sense to me that that would be the same source. And then I made one assumption. And it's a very simple assumption. What if that source is good? And what if that source wants to share the truth about all these laws with me? And then it made sense to me. I, I started going, ah, maybe my better option was to stop trying to find the individual laws and to focus on the source of them first. Because the laws involving the source would actually probably tell me a lot about all the other laws. Does that make sense? And so from that time on, I focused my attention in finding out the laws that govern my connection with the source. Hopefully, it's not the source calling. It's the first time I've ever seen him use a phone anyway. Okay. So, can you see, from a logical perspective, it makes complete sense to actually, firstly in your life, experiment with the laws that govern your interaction with the source of all laws than it does to actually experiment with the laws that that source has created. Now, what mankind does, and we've become addicted to doing this, by the way, we've decided to forget about the source because we believe, most of us believe, that such a connection with the source where the source wants to tell us everything is not possible. Can you see? We've told ourselves a belief, and in the process of telling ourselves this belief, we have closed down all investigation or experiments into that. And we've given up the process of experimenting in that particular area. So instead what we've done is we've focused more of our attention on trying to discover the laws themselves. Now, given an eternal and everlasting and infinite universe, which science has now discovered is, is continuously expanding, given that, it would make sense that if it's continually expanding and it's infinite, that it would make sense that the laws that are created within this universe are probably also, if not expanding, already infinite in number. And I don't know about you, but discovering 40 years, if I spend 40 years studying the law of gravity, right, and then 40 years on the law of aerodynamics, and then 40 years on the, who knows what other laws I might be discovering, can you see my life might be chewed up pretty rapidly, particularly my life on Earth? And then let's say I pass into the spirit world, which I know exists, but let's not assume that it exists, because most people don't assume it exists. There's only 80 years for most people to discover most of these laws. And so what do they do? They go, that's all a waste of time. I might as well just have some fun. Right? 
And this is where a lot of our viewpoints of life come from. This idea that it's impossible for us to discover everything, so why bother trying to discover anything? Why not just live in it? And many of us have chosen to do that, actually. Many people on the planet choose to do that. But I'm suggesting that if the physical laws are infinite in nature, the spiritual laws are infinite in nature, it would make sense that that's the case, and the soul-based laws might be infinite in nature too, then boy, that's going to be a lot of my time chewed up trying to find out about these laws. And in the end, I still won't know the source. I still won't know the source of the laws. And what if I have the option of knowing the source of the laws and the source of the laws tells me all the laws? Yeah, that would be a much better option, I feel. And that is where I feel it's a much more logical thing to try to do, to, to work out whether there is such a thing as a connection with the source. Okay. But if we get back to our discussion about faith, can you see that the kind of faith I'm speaking of is not the kind of faith that is blind. It's not the kind of faith that's just a belief system without any backing. It's not the kind of faith that's just a concept in your own imagination. But it's actually based on reality. It's based on scientific, verifiable facts. That's the kind of faith that we need to have. Does that make sense? Graham? Um, I see there's a problem with facts. Um, sure. And that, you know, people, some people choose to believe some things as facts and other people will choose to believe they're not facts. Yeah, and see, I'm not speaking of that. What I'm speaking about is what is the actual fact. <laughs> yes, I know, but you're quoting science all the time and even scientists can't agree. Like I was reading in The Australian this morning how a few decades ago scientists were saying that the fact was that people with schizophrenia um, were no more likely to be violent than normal people. And now scientists are saying, oh, they can be up to nine times more violent than normal people. So what scientifically agreed was facts a few decades ago was different to what is scientifically agreed now. I agree, but if somebody didn't do the experiment trying to find more facts, we would never know that. But like the, the, if you have a belief in something, you tend to um, find facts that support that belief. But, but uh, sooner or later, with the way God's universal laws work, you can, if you have a sincere desire to experiment, you will soon find out through a process that everything that you previously believed about that particular thing might be wrong. So I, I can't see how that is different to what I'm saying. It just seems to me it's um, a long, drawn-out process discovering what are actually the facts. Oh, I agree. I agree. Like with the law of aerodynamics, it was a 3,700-year process. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not disputing that it's a long process. What I'm saying, though, is that in the end, we now trust it with our very lives, do we not? Right? And we know it to be a fact because we experience it. And, and it's very different experiencing it than just theorising about it. And what I would suggest to you is that the first example you gave were people just theorising without having the facts at their disposal. But once they measured the facts by getting all the so-called schizophrenic people together and working out what happened with their life, once they could measure the facts, then they realised that that original postulation was incorrect. And this is OK, I feel. It's the discovery of facts like that. Yeah, I know, and I agree with you totally. I'm not trying to... Um... So what's the emotional problem you have with it? Um... Can you see the emotional problem you have with it is you, you don't want to take that long. <laughs> Can you see that? And you want to know what is the actual fact right now. Yeah. And I'm telling you it's impossible for anybody to give you that information. Even God can't give you that information, given the current development. All future discovery will be a process. No one here... Now, again, it's logical. And this is something I feel you don't really understand at the soul level. And many of you do not understand this at the soul level. Because if you did, you wouldn't be so frightened about hearing truth. 
and you wouldn't be so frightened about making mistakes. Because if you understood at the soul level that your life from now on is going to be a process of discovery of new things, you wouldn't, you wouldn't decide to wait around until somebody tells you the truth of it. You'd be a part of the discovery. Does that make sense? Many of us don't do that. And the reason why we don't do that is because we're afraid. And this is where our fear has a major impact upon our willingness to engage the process of our life. If you truly understood the truth that, th that we live in an infinite universe and that only God knows everything, because God is the source, the one who created it, if we understand that fact, then we would not be so hung up about the fact that we don't know things. And we would not be so hung up about making mistakes. We'd be perfectly okay with making mistakes. M many of you are not okay with making mistakes at all. right? I know that because when, I when you ask me for my opinion about earth changes, for example, and I tell you I, this is what I feel today, you then go away hoping it's a fact. W what have I just said about opinions? What did I say opinions were? They're just suppositions, but what are they? They are not facts. <laughs> when you ask me for my opinion about something, and if I don't know if it's a fact, I tell you, well, this is my opinion at the time, and yet you go away thinking or wanting it to be a fact. That's totally ludicrous. Why would you do such a thing? I know certain things are facts because I've had my own experience with those particular things, and faith is one of those things that I know is a fact, right? that we're talking about today. Tomorrow we'll be talking about prayer and I know it works as a fact. I've had a whole life of it as a fact. 2,000 years of life of it as a fact. I know it works. I know what it does. These are facts that I'm presenting to you. That's different than you asking me for my opinion about what might happen in the future. I've got no idea. That's a fact. I've got no idea. I only have an opinion, just like you might have one. Does that make sense? Because nobody would know that as a fact, except perhaps God, who created all the laws involved that create the future. But I don't know. I cannot predict your future. Many of us want the prediction of a future. Why? Because we're afraid to engage our day-to-day -day life, discovering and experimenting with our life to determine what the facts are. Does that make sense? That's why we, we don't engage. And this is the problem that we have. So opinions are not worth much. So when the, first, when the scientific community says, we believe, da 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 to me they are just presenting their opinion without knowing the full facts yet. And so I'm not, I'm not totally addicted to going, well, that means that's true and that's, uh, I can base my whole life on that. And I would say to you and suggest to you that you're very unwise doing the same. Because there is so much more for us to discover. And that makes sense. In an in a infinite universe, it makes sense that we would get, we're going to have more to discover. Does it not? Every single day there will be more to discover. Do you want to engage the discovery? Or are you just going to sit back and have your experiential life without dis discovering more waiting for other people to do all the discoveries for you. And the irony is, who's the person that's going to enjoy those discoveries the most? Is the person who discovers them, not you. Right? And that's a fact. <laughs> the reason why that's a fact is because the people who come along afterwards have not had to go through the process and since they have not had to go through the process, they don't have a full appreciation of what's involved in understanding these facts. And if you don't have a full appreciation, you don't have gratitude and you don't really engage it. So I'm suggesting that unless you're willing to live your life like this, as an experiment, and unless you're willing to discover more and more and more of God's laws as an experiment for you personally, 
you are not going to have the same kind of joy as a person who does those things. There's also another reason, and that is this. If I'm, if I'm a person who's a pianist, and I'm playing the piano, and I play it beautifully, and you go, and you come up to me and you say, I would love to be able to play the piano like you do. And I can tell you as a fact that you are able to play the piano as good as anyone who's ever lived. Huh? Now that's a fact. But is it ever going to be your reality unless you have some faith that you can make it your fact? You see, just because facts are presented to you it does not mean that you believe them or that they will affect your life in a positive direction. So a person can get up in front of you like this and tell you fact after fact. But unless you personally engage something where you want to experience that particular thing, you will not ever have the benefit of those facts in your personal life. Um, it just doesn't seem very efficient. Like the Wright brothers discovered the rules of the laws of aerodynamics, and we all benefit from those. Mm -hmm. And so we can't rely on Jesus to discover all the laws of the soul. And the By the way, they, they didn't discover all the laws of aerodynamics. Oh, okay. It did start a long time. It started ago. many, many thousands of years prior mm -hmm. to them, in fact. So there was a succession of people who had that desire. Yes. And they discovered those laws. All with limited lifetimes. And now we all benefit. What I'm saying is that we don't need to discover the laws of aerodynamics for ourselves. No, but, but, but when you fly, you certainly appreciate knowing them and understanding them as a fact, do you not? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm still think, feeling like, um, well, to me, the, the fast track is to find Jesus because he's worked out all the laws of <laughs> the spirit life and the soul and learn them from him. As opposed to but what to I'm saying is, myself. even if you find Jesus and you listen to every single thing he says, which is quite difficult, as you know, <laughs> <laughs> from personal experience, <laughs> and, and apply absolutely everything, unless you, unless you engage a process that he describes, you will never know these things as a fact. Does that make sense? So, so this is the problem. Now, don't take the analogy too far with this physical thing that I'm talking about because there's, we've got to get into the discussion about faith and what that really is as a part of this. But it's important for you to realise that you can listen to somebody present to you fact after fact after fact after fact and have no appreciation for it whatsoever, have no appreciation for how it's going to change your life in any way, have no appreciation of how it's going to affect your future and have very little desire to engage any of it. That's a fact too. You can choose to do all of that. Right? So it requires more than just the presentation of facts and listening to somebody present facts to you before you will engage the process of changing your own life. Far more. And this is where faith is involved. Which is proven by the fact that we've listened to you for four years and not necessarily done the first thing that you've shared with us. Yes, many of you come up to me four years later and go, you know that thing you said four years ago? I'm just realising that I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and I go, yeah, that's right. That, that's what it's like unless you engage this other process which we want to talk to you about. And, and, and what I'm illustrating to you, and already you as an audience are starting to see the flaws with the normal types of faith. So what I'm talking about is this faith based on facts, but you're starting to see the flaws. The flaws are, well, the trouble is I only have a certain amount of facts. So at any one point in time, I've only got a limited number of facts. I haven't got all the facts, right? So therefore, I don't know all the reality. I only know a limited reality. Are you starting to see that, right? You, you're also starting to see that unless you personally experience something, while it might be a fact... It doesn't mean it's a fact for you, right? So, so it might be a fact in terms of how the universe operates and how everything works, but it might not be a fact for you personally until you go through some kind of different process. Does that make sense? And this is why 
why, this is why we start presenting facts after fact after fact after fact. And many of you now have come to long enough sessions to have quite a lot of facts presented to you, right? But some of you have done that without changing at all. Why? Because it has yet to be engaged something inside of you that causes you to desire to actually take some action based upon these facts. So now we're starting to see that there is a relationship between the fact, the, the actual reality, and whether you will choose to act upon them. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> facts, facts. Hmm. Funny the English language sometimes, right? You see, you see, quite often we are presented with fact after fact after fact in our personal life. And God's doing this, by the way, with you every single moment of every single day of your entire existence, whether it's here on earth or in the spirit world. God is presenting you fact after fact after fact after fact. So when you have an accident, you know, like I did this morning, I had an accident, I was just working on a... On a on a redundant array server <laughs> and it had a very sharp edge and it cut me across there and I go, hmm, that's an interesting fact. God is just telling me something here, this accident, no accident happens by chance. I've learnt that enough about all of the other laws to know that me cutting myself on my left hand just before a seminar and having to patch myself up with super glue so that I don't bleed everywhere has some kind of Significance. Does that make sense? And I've just got to find what that is. Right? I've just got to find what that is. Now, often we can listen to a whole group of facts and never act upon any of them. Right? What are the facts you act upon? Have you given that much thought? I'm not asking what ones they are. I'm asking what group of facts... Do you act upon? Do. Well, let's, let's, uh, Tris, come to Tris. Usually the ones I'm not afraid of. The ones you're not afraid of? Yes, let's make a bit of a list here. The ones we're not afraid of. Angela, please. Uh, family beliefs? Yeah, but I would say that a lot of them aren't facts. <laughs> I'm talking about the actual facts that you act, act upon. What are the ones you act upon? Helga, thanks. The ones that keep me inside of my comfort zone? Well, let's not analyse it too much. What, what is it about the ones that, are, that make you comfortable? What, what, what is it? The ones that I already know. No, the ones you already know, but some of the ones that you don't know you act upon, so that's not always the case. But, but think back to your comfort zone thing. What is it there? You like them, don't yes. you? Yes, my addiction. And your like of them causes you to act upon them. Isn't that true? Yes. And that's what causes us to act. You see, in, in, the way God's doing, presenting us the truth is that God's presenting us the truth of millions of facts. So many facts that we don't know them all. And, and one person in a lifetime can never even discover hardly any of them. And what causes us to act upon them is not the facts themselves. It's if we feel there is a personal benefit to acting upon it. And if we feel there's a personal benefit, we will act upon it. But if we don't feel there's a personal benefit then we will not act upon it. Can you see that? Huh? Hi, Jesus. Hey, Dorma. Good, thanks. Um, you said something a long time ago that I, um, I don't think I had faith in, but I hoped. And over the time, I verbalised that hope, mm -hmm. I felt. Yep. Um, and... And God in, and I haven't acted on it really, although I've verbalised it to other people and other people were convinced that I had total faith in it, I believe, at the mm. time. But God in my law of attraction showing me now it's the truth. Yeah. 
So... Well, this is what we want to talk about more. How these things, how faith, hope, and finish up trust, which is the end result where we have full, complete confidence. How these things are all related and what motivates. But what we're trying to get at at this point, and, and this is an important point that I'm trying to make, is that your deciding to act doesn't depend upon the facts so much. It depends upon whether you feel there's a personal benefit. All right? That's what it depends upon. So many of you are willing to act upon things that are not facts because you believe there's a personal benefit. All right? And many of you are willing to actually try to break God's facts in order to get the personal benefit. Right? And that's a problem if we're really ever going to become harmonious with the laws that govern our very existence. So a lot of the times what we're trying to do is we're not really trying to discover law. You know what we're most of us trying to do instead? We're trying to do this. Are we not? Is it two L's? That's what we're trying to do most of the time. And why do we try to do that? Because we do not believe that finding and discovering more laws that God has created will give us freedom. We believe what it will do is constrain us. We believe it's going to restrict us further by knowing the laws. And so we've come up with this term. You know the term. It says ignorance is bliss. Isn't it? Is that the term that we offer the news? I can tell you as a fact that ignorance is not bliss. Bliss is knowing all of the laws and living by them. That's bliss. Right? So it's not ignorance that's, a, that's bliss. It's knowing everything, all the laws that govern your existence and living by them. That brings you bliss. Yep. We come down in front to Jennifer. Wouldn't it be more um, wanting to live by the laws is bliss? Because like, I can live by the laws, but I can be really you know, angry about it or anxious about it. Or... But the reality is, Jennifer, and this is something that you've yet to really understand, I feel. The reality is that if you want to break the law while you're living by the law, you will never experience the bliss that comes from living by the law. Because there's a law that governs that as well. Does that make sense? And most of us have yet to discover the laws that cause our own pain as a result of our own rebellion or not even as a result of our rebellion. Many of us are reluctant and, and <coughs> obeyers. We reluctantly obey, right? How many of you would classify as a person that reluctantly obeys? You think about the laws of the land. How many of them do you reluctantly obey? <laughs> yeah, you, you imagine, so God's made this beautiful universe full of laws that are all created that will allow us to experience bliss if we engage every one of them. But the majority of us are not interested in finding the physical ones. We're not interested in finding the spiritual ones. And we're not interested in finding the soul-based laws because we want to be a rebel without a cause. <laughs> and there is no reason for doing it, but we want to be a rebel. And, and the things we can't rebel against without getting the real problem, we reluctantly obey. Now, under those circumstances, you are never going to experience bliss, ever. Mary? Uh, I also feel we'll never experience faith. Exactly. 
Because it seems to me that faith comes when we experience the facts, not when we hear them. Yes. And if we reluctantly, if, if our heart really wants to rebel, then we never actually experience faith. We never expect, experience the fact which builds our faith. Exactly. Yeah. And that for that reason, the majority of you here in the audience have no faith in anything that I've presented to you. Isn't that interesting? Because you're yet to want to want to experience it. You see? You reluctantly engage it many times. You go, oh, there, there's a law of attraction again in my <laughs> life, right? And you get all upset about it. Like, as if God's making a mistake. God made a mistake with that law, you know. <laughs> I'm getting this attraction and my soul attracted it. I know that. What? I wish I never heard that. I wish I never heard that my soul attracts these events. Right? We were having a conversation the other day with someone who was just angry that they were attracting that thing. I go, yeah, that's the, that's the rebellion, you know. You, you don't want to accept... That, that there's a law involved that's perfect and it's only our disharmony with it that causes these attractions. We don't want to accept that, right? And we go, no, no, it's not my fault. If it's not your fault, then whose fault is it? Like if you're attracted something into your personal life and it's not your fault, then whose fault is it? Well, to be honest, most of you believe it's God's fault. He shouldn't have made the law. If he, made, if he made the law different, I'd have a different outcome, is the way that we often view it, right? But, but we don't understand. The law of gravity has, is fact, but it has some beautiful results, eh? Yeah. It, it, it meant that your very life lasted longer than about 25 seconds. Because otherwise you would have popped out of mum and flown off into space. <laughs> right? That's a loving outcome. You had a longer life than 25 seconds. And there goes the law of gravity, another loving outcome, right? right? And the law of aerodynamics have loving outcomes. All the, even all the physical laws have loving outcomes. Why wouldn't you then assume that all of the other laws that govern the other parts of your existence all also have loving outcomes if you understand them and engage them? Why wouldn't you assume this? Because you know what? We're totally addicted to having what we believe are our desires met. And so we only listen to the facts that meet up with our desires. We are totally dismissive of all the other facts, including dismissive of the very facts of what's happening to our life. Right? So we get a sore or some you know, ache here, pain there, whatever, we're totally dismissive of these facts that are being presented to us, not understanding. And the reason why we're dismissive, because we want to rebel, we're reluctant obeyers of the law. The majority of us have to work on that. Because, because if you truly want to ever have any faith about God and the future, you're going to have to learn to move from being a reluctant obeyer into wanting to understand the law and obey it, because it's the desire to understand the law and obey it that's given us the beautiful things that it's already given us. So, we benefit from somebody deciding that they wanted to understand the law of aerodynamics. Right? How many of you would have ever flown on your own desire if you didn't if we, somebody else didn't discover the law of aerodynamics, how many of you would have attempted to go through what, say, White, Whitehead, George Whitehead went through or, or the Wright brothers went through, where you spent a whole life discovering one particular thing just so you could do it? How many of you would be willing to do that? I suggest not very many of us. There are some of us, but not very many of us that are willing to do that. And the reason why is because... We feel certain things about law. We feel it's going to restrict us. Now, that, that is, there is no real reason why we could ever think that. Every time mankind has discovered a physical law, it has always resulted, in, that, that's an actual fact of the universe, 
it has always resulted in more freedom for mankind. So how can you then go, if I discover or know about a law that applies to me personally, that it's going to result in less freedom? How can you do that? You can't. Not logically. Right? Can I just move on there? Yep. So let's uh, move on to the point that I'm trying to make about faith, shall we? So we've seen this relationship now, that there are physical, spiritual and possible Possibly, there are physical laws, we know that for a certain. Possibly there's spiritual laws, and possibly there's soul-based laws. And somebody has to do some experiments <laughs> to find out. Right? Otherwise, none of us are ever going to find out. And what I'm suggesting to you is what's going to, what is going to make you be one of those people that experiment? You're going to have to see somehow that there is a personal benefit... To doing it because that's the only thing that's going to drive you to do it right? now the problem with most uh, religious philosophies on the planet is that there does not seem much personal benefit to follow them because they feel restrictive they feel like they're imposing more and more you know constraints upon you generally and that's why for the majority of people they feel like I don't want to know more about religion. Every time I find out something more, it feels like there's another restriction on me. And another, and another, and another, and another. And, and in fact, there are whole books written about what restrictions should apply to an average person with faith. But if we examine faith generally on the planet, and now I'm speaking more about faith, about the bigger things in the universe. So, so I've, I've illustrated at this point that we all have faith in physical things. And our day-to-day -day lives are proof of the faith that we have in physical things. Very few of us have faith in spiritual things, and almost none of us have faith in soul-based things. That's the reality. And what I'm suggesting is, to gain a faith, there's got to be some kind of experiments, and our focus needs to change. Instead of focusing on the physical as we do, and we experiment often every single day with the physical, instead of doing that, we need to start experimenting with the spiritual and with the soul-based things that we're, we're, we're attempting to experiment with. And there has to be a reason for you to do it. Because without the reason, you won't do it without there being some desire that causes you to move forward in this regard, you won't do it. And it doesn't matter how many facts are presented to you about the spiritual, and it doesn't matter how many facts are presented to you about the soul, you will not do anything about them. You will not, unless you believe there is a personal advantage to doing it. Right? If there's no personal advantage, then there's little point in doing it, is the way most of us would feel. Now, some of us have the more collective viewpoint in, the say, in, in that we say, if there is no advantage to humankind, then I wouldn't do it. But that's just an extension of the individual restriction that we've placed. And what I'm, I'm stating is that if we are truly ever going to experiment with what is going on with our life and what's actually happening in terms of God's laws and so forth, what we need to start doing is experimenting with the truths of the universe rather than just focusing on the physical. And I'm suggesting there are far more truths than the physical. But let's uh, look at the relationship between this now. We've decided and we've established that there are physical laws. And those physical laws, the more of which we've discovered, have created freedom to a degree. In the process of discovering freedom, they give us more joy in our life, supposedly, in some cases. But isn't it fantastic that you can go from one country to another country and see the world now? When, when 100 years ago to do that, you had to do it by a ship. You know, and for the previous 5,000 years, you had to do it by a ship, and you had to be pretty brave. Right? Because a lot of the ships weren't that stable, right? And safe. 
And yet now we can just say, oh, I'd like to go to Bali. You know, you fork out a few hundred bucks to, to whomever carrier is going to carry us, and they've engaged all of the laws involved, getting us safely from Australia to Bali and back home again. We can go there in two weeks. And when we say in two weeks, I'm not saying that it takes two weeks to get there. It takes, what, four or five hours to get there, and then we're back home. You know, we spend all of the time enjoying that particular location and come home. So it has improved our joy and our freedom, these physical laws. And I'm suggesting to you that the discovery of spiritual laws results in even greater freedom with even greater joy. And I'm suggesting to you that discovery of soul-based laws results in the most intense freedom you can ever experience and therefore the most intense joy you will ever have. That's what I'm suggesting. But the problem is most of us don't believe it. And your day-to-day -day life is fact that you don't believe it, actually. If you look at the amount of time you spend engaging any of these laws in an understanding manner in your day-to-day -day life, what would you find? Remember in the previous talk I said, what is your treasure? We talked about what is your treasure. And I said, add up the amount of time you spend on something and that's how dedicated you are to finding out about that particular thing. All right, so let's look at the amount of time we spend discovering new physical laws. How many of you do that? Discovering new physical laws. How much time in a week would you spend? For the majority of us, it would be zero hours on that. <laughs> because we're very reliant on... That's a scientist does that for me. You know, we, we, we're reliant on other people doing it, aren't we? Right, so, so, so we do zero hours. How, many time, how much time do we spend trying to discover the spiritual laws of the universe? You know, these are the kind of things that affect like the relationship between the spirit body and the material body. What happens in my spirit body? What happens in my physical body? What the, what's going on between these two bodies? How is it that my physical body gets disease? How is that related to my spirit body somehow? What's going on in my spirit body that causes those particular things? All of these kind of investigations communicating with people who have passed, you know, that people who live in the spirit form only, seeing them, connecting with them, sharing moments with them. In a conscious manner, how many hours a week, would, uh, on the average, would we spend doing that? For many of us, it's the zero there too, right? <laughs> right? But, but let's say, for some of you, it's not the case, so you might spend a few hours a week, let's say. All right. Now, can you see, we're not going to end up finding out very much with this kind of a lifestyle, right? But, but let's go on to the soul-based laws. So this is the kind of thing where we're experimenting with how the soul affects the spirit body and how the soul affects the material body and what things inside of the soul are working and what laws can I discover that govern the operation of my own soul and govern how my soul works and exists and, and experiences things in the universe and how information is fed into the soul, how the soul union can be engaged, how the soul, other half of your soul can be engaged and so forth. How many hours a week would the average, average person spend on that, do you think? Well, again, it's probably zero. <laughs> right? Now, for many of you, you've now started that process, yes? But if we're sincere about it, we're probably only spending a few hours a week. Right? Many of us, right? So we might spend two or three hours a week. Right? How many hours do you spend eating? For a lot of us, we'd like to eat the whole day. <laughs> we graze, shall we say. Right. But if you compare the amount of time, let's look at it. Let's say brekkie is a quarter of an hour, lunch is uh, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour maybe, dinner time we might spend a, a half an hour to an hour on that. It's about what, one and a half, two hours a day. Let's say two hours a day times by seven days a week, 14 hours. We spend more hours eating than we do discovering the very laws that govern our entire existence. Right. How many how many hours do you spend having a cup of coffee? <laughs> Zero. Cup of tea. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Can you see that quite often we are engaged in the things that we believe we're benefiting from? But the reality is that we as a human race and personally would benefit far more from the examination of these laws than we can even imagine at this point in time. And yet we don't engage the process. We don't engage the process. Why don't we engage the process? Because we do not have faith. That's why we don't engage the process. We do not believe truly in our heart that engaging the process of the discovery of these things will bring us any personal benefit. Right? And this is the kind of faith we're going to have to develop if we're truly going to change. We're going to have to have the faith where these things, the discovery of all the things to do that are facts, by the way, these are facts of the universe. There are facts that govern the physical universe. There are facts that govern the spiritual universes. There's facts that govern the soul-based universes, all of which are important to your future existence. And unless you develop some kind of faith which incorporates a desire to discover them, you will never change. You will never discover them. You, you, when I say you'll never change, of course you will change because the whole of God's laws are governed towards you changing. Sooner or later, you're going to have to change, even if you don't want to, but it's going to be a slow, laborious process unless you engage this faith. Now, in the Paget messages, there's a very, very short message uh, by Solomon. And myself and Mary have discussed it, and we've placed a recording of it on the internet, which you will see probably arrive there next week. Um, it's a, it's a message from Solomon from 1915 that was given in the Paget messages. But basically it says this. Paget said, What are the most important things in all the universe? Now, that's a pretty big question, right? Now, can you imagine yourself sitting down there, writing to a spirit who is channeling to you, and you're saying, Please tell me what you believe are the most important things in all the universe. What would you be expecting to get as an answer? Well, Paget never expected his answer. Because Solomon said to him, three things. One on the part of God and two on the part of man. The thing on the part of God, he said, was the most important thing in all the universe was God's personal love for each individual human. The divine love. That is the most important thing in all the universe that you could ever engage. That's what Solomon said. And by the way, this is a guy who's lived three and a half thousand years. Uh, um, actually, a bit longer than that. And, and therefore has a fairly good idea that he's saying the truth. Right? And then he said, on the part of man, there are two the things that are the most important things in all the universe. You know what he said they were? The first one was faith. And the second one was prayer. He said, because divine love, God's love, is the thing that you can receive that will transform your entire life. And it, and, it, and it leads to complete bliss. And faith and prayer are the only two things you need in order to receive it. And this is a man who has spent three and a half thousand years examining the laws of the universe. So I don't know about you, but I think it would be wise to have a listen to what he's got to say with regard to what he thinks is the most important things. Right? And he's saying that from God's perspective, the divine love is the most important thing that you will ever work your way through to experiencing in your entire life, in your entire existence. It is more important than your cup of tea. 
And even more important than your meal, actually. It's more important than anything you can imagine in terms of transforming your life. And, and Solomon said that there's only two things that you need in order to receive it. Faith is one of them. And prayer, which is the longing of your heart, the desire of your heart projected towards God to receive it, is the other. They are the two things you need. And that's why, and I've, got a long, I've gotten a long way around to saying it, but that's why that has become our topic for today. And that's our topic for tomorrow. Because they are the only two things you are ever going to need in order to discover all of these things. All of these things will come to you through this process of discovery and proper application of these things. Now what I see is that many of you are worried so much about all sorts of things in your day-to-day -day life. You hear the divine truth and you get it presented to you and then what you do is you go, oh, I've got to think about the law of attraction here and I've got to work out how that's affecting me there and what addiction I'm in here and what's going on there. And No, you don't. Do you think I do all of those things? All I'm doing is telling you the truth about those things and they all influence these two things. This reason why we've talked about them is because they all influence these things. Your faith is so severely influenced by so many things that you'd be totally so shocked of, in fact. Right? Many of you, for example, have this feeling in you of rebellion. Remember just before I asked about that and almost everybody put their hand up about that one. Do you know how much that feeling affects your faith? You have, an, you have a direct desire to not know the truth. That's what rebellion is about. A direct desire to not understand. A direct desire to not understand the law. Right? Now, do you think you're going to ever get closer to the creator of the laws if you've got a direct desire to rebel against every law that that creator created? Now, that doesn't make too much logical sense to me. And I'm sure it doesn't to you either if you think about it. But it, this is what we do. We are constantly trying to avoid the creator, the source, and avoid the experience of divine love. And as a result, we can't grow, we can't change. And one of the things Solomon said in this, in this message was this. He said, when the love comes, then faith will come along with it. So, what did he mean by that, do you think? Instead of having all of you guess, how about I just say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what is love? How would you describe it as a quality? A quality. Let's describe it as an emotion. What, what, how does it feel? How does it feel to you, love? Can you describe the kinds of things that give you the feeling of love? So start with Jen. It's interesting, isn't it, that we've discussed love for five years, and when we start talking about it, we still are pretty confused. Yeah? Fire away, Jen. It cleanses and purifies. So it like goes. Yeah, see, now you're talking about its operation. I don't, I, I not want to know about its operation. I want to know about its feelings. What's the feeling? Warmth. If we could just come straight down, Suze, in front. For me, I think it's kind of, it's a surrender. It's a giving up to... See, that's another operation. Yeah. It's not a feeling. Yeah, can we... Let's, come, let's, uh, let's go, who hasn't had a go yet? If we go Rochelle right up the back, and then straight in front, and then Deb hasn't had a go yet. So you can go. Um, from what I've experienced, it feels soft and gentle. and. So it has a gentleness to it, I would agree with that. It's gentle. Softness. But that, that's sort of... Uh, 
like like a pillow is soft and said, well, you know, like <laughs> so I don't know, you know. Um, so we're coming down the front. Yep. Uh, I was going to say it's softening as well, but also um, that it, it, it touches, it kind of melts the heart. It so does, but that is an operation again. It's like you know, that's similar to the operations okay. before. Do you, do you know why you're having so much trouble knowing? Because you don't experience it very often. That's sad, eh? That just tells us how sad it really is, isn't it? If we come down to Deb, down, to, down here. Uh, for me, it's a feeling of security where there is no fear. It banishes, it, yeah. it, it can nullifies we see, fear. Can we see how each of us is going down this track of going, it's not this and it's not that, and it has this operation and has that operation, but we're not actually describing the sensations, are we, in terms of qualities, right? So we've come across to Kate and then across to Rob on this side. Pleasure? So there's a joy or a pleasure in it, isn't there? You would definitely, that, that's a quality, isn't it? Joy or a pleasure in it, certainly. What kind of joy or pleasure it is, too? Like, what, what kind of joy or pleasure? Because the flavours to it, isn't there? Robert? Okay. Uh, I feel um, supported and understood. Yep. But when somebody can understand up. you and have no love for you at all. Yeah. 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 So that doesn't necessarily guarantee love either, does it? Yeah. Uh, so, Kate, you want to... A generosity. It's Generous got a generosity pleasure. to it, yes. Where it's... Shall we call it giving? All right. Yes. Next here, okay. Hello. Um, on, along those lines, I was going to say it's a gift from God. It's a gift. Let's call it a gift. Right. Many of you don't see it as a gift. You see it as an expectation. That's why you don't experience it very often, right? You go, I want my husband to love me. And if he runs off with another woman, then he doesn't love me. That's your expectation, right? That, that didn't go down well. <laughs> It's not very peaceful to hear that. <laughs> not very peaceful to hear that. You see, if you, if you truly loved your partner, it would not affect you when they went off with another person. You would still love them if it was truly present, right? You would still have feelings for them of kindness, compassion. So this, this, these are the kind of things that we need to be listing here. Yeah? Qualities like kindness, it's compassionate. Yeah. Those are the kind of qualities now that we're starting to, that are really about love, right? And where were we? Was it okay? And if we go across the. Forgiving. Sorry? Forgiving. It's forgiving, yeah. But really, that's an operation again, isn't it? So, yeah. Feelings we're looking for here. Zinko, right at the back, thanks. Um, feeling inspirational, enthusiasm. So it inspires. And you've missed out one really good one. It's about enthusiasm, but it excites you. Yeah, sorry. yeah. Doesn't it? Like, how many of you go, uh, when you were teenagers and you fell in love and you went, oh, yeah, I'm in love. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, as if, as if. Right, it just excites you with a pa passion, isn't it? It creates passion, longing, right? Does it not? Longing within the soul. Right, these are all the things that love does, right? Mari, if we were right at the back there. And then down. Could I say bliss? Bliss, but yeah, bliss is an overused uh, word nowadays. You know, a lot of people say they're in bliss when I look at their life and I go, yeah, you're not in bliss. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I feel we need to be more specific. Yeah. If we come down the side here. Thanks. 
and then down the front after. For me, it often is electrifying and enlivens, you know, like, like the whole body comes alive and I can't sit still. It's like there's a million things going on and even though I'm really tired, I can't possibly sleep because I'm just so alive. Yeah, exactly. It just it is like that, isn't it? You come down. Um, it feels delicate and sweet to me. Sweet, yeah, delicate. Nice words, yeah. Sweet. When you think about it, it's not often that we experience these feelings, eh? Unfortunately. And, um, and the reality is that these, all of these feelings, if you think about those feelings, they are all a measure of how enjoyable your entire life will be. And what I'm saying to you is that faith and prayer are going to lead to these things. Now, do you know why the majority of you are not finding those things in your experience of the divine truth? Because you're hearing facts without having any faith or prayer. Do you get that? You're hearing facts. You, you having presented to you in these kind of discussions fact after fact after fact. But because they're not becoming a personal experience in any way, you're not, it's not going to lead to any joy. And instead you become traumatised. So many of you are worried. The more you hear, the more worried you become. Have you noticed that? For some of you? Oh, am I doing this? What am I doing? Have I broken that law? No, I don't know. What am I doing now? Isn't that how it is for many of you? Oh, no, what's happening now? This and that. What? And the reason why we're doing all of that is because we are not, we are so, we are so worried about making mistakes. And the more truth we hear, the more worried about making a mistake we become. Right? Now, do you think a person who's living in faith worries about making mistakes? The reason why is because they know they've got nothing to worry about. Right? The more faith they have, and particularly when we talk about what we can have faith in in a minute or after the break, depending on what time it is. What time is it, by the way? Ten to three. So after the break it will be. And the more things we can have faith about, and the more this faith moves us to action, and prayer is an action, a feeling that comes from our soul. So it's something we have to act upon. And the more divine love that we receive, the more this becomes our result. Now, I say to you, who wouldn't want those things? But, but unfortunately, most of us have no faith we're going to get them if we engage prayer. We believe we're going to get them by engaging something else. Know, by figuring out the law of attraction. Has that worked for you? Do you feel happier doing that? No. I don't know anybody who feels happier doing that. Or somebody who's trying to live by the law, live by the law. What law is there? What law am I breaking here? What law am I breaking here? What, what do you become? <laughs> what was the words? <laughs> Paranoid. Yes, I agree with that one. And what was the other word? Was it your word going? Neurotic, yes, I agree with that one. That's what you're becoming. Some of you are becoming that, right? Have you noticed? Have you noticed your own neurosis developing? Right? That's not divine truth. Right? That, that is you being afraid of the laws. You're afraid of God. You're not willing to address those particular emotions. And the more emotions you're not willing to address the less of this you will finish up receiving and, uh, and, and having and possessing as a part of your very life. And these two things are the things that are going to lead you there. So I, what I'm saying to you is, it makes sense to me 
And while it might not make sense to you yet, it makes sense to me that if the physical laws, when mankind discovers more physical laws, it results in more freedom for mankind, and as a result, it res results in more joy of the experience of life, then I am suggesting to you that if you focus on also discovering these laws in your day-to-day -day life, that this is also going to result in more freedom and more joy in your day-to-day -day life. And I'm suggesting to you that the biggest law possible that you could ever discover is the law of divine love. And I'm suggesting to you that if you focus most of your life and attention on the discovery and application of that particular law and you find out everything you possibly can find out about it and you put it into practice, not just think about it, but put it into practice not, not because there is no benefit but because there is a going to be a personal benefit to you that's the greatest benefit to your entire future existence, then I suggest you'll engage those laws. If you understood the power that these laws have upon your very existence now and for your eternal future, you would not hesitate to engage these laws. They would become, like you remember before when we were talking about how many hours we spent engaging the laws? How many hours would we spend? We've got, what is it, how many hours in a week there's there? Who's fast? Well, let, let's, let's help you. It's 24 times 7. All right. Four sevens are 8, 14, carry. You got it? What is it? That's exactly right. Many of us don't even know how many hours we've got to discover the laws, <laughs> let alone discover them. But if, imagine if, now, now, now you think about it, when you're asleep, you're still awake. You're awake in the spirit world. Now, if you spent, if you actually had a longing in your own soul to discover law, you would want to discover law 168 hours of the week. If you knew that it had such a powerful effect on your future existence, that's what we'd probably want to do. Now, we can discover law while we're having a cup of tea. And we can discover law, that's the beauty of this. You can still eat, and you can still sleep, and you can still do all these other things that you need to do for your very life, and still discover laws 168 hours of the week. You can discover laws while you're asleep in your sleep state. Right? Many of you won't know that until you go into the spirit world and you remember your sleep state. And then you'll realise that you were discovering laws then too. But for the majority of us, we're not discovering laws. We're avoiding them. Right? And what I'm suggesting is if you truly had faith in God's love, you would not be avoiding law. You would not be avoiding prayer. It would become a high priority in your day-to-day -day life and existence. Harry? So just going back to what you said at the start of the talk about the law of gravity. Mm -hmm. And you were saying we all have like unquestioning faith in the law of gravity. Mm -hmm. And that's because we experience it all the time. We experience it all the time and experience the benefits of it. We can feel the benefits of it all the time. Right. So that tells me in order to grow faith, I must have an experience. Yes. And, and this is what Solomon was saying. Yes. Faith will come to me if, if at the moment, let's, let's admit to ourselves, shall we, that at the moment we don't have a very strong faith in God. <coughs> For many of us, we're not even really sure whether God exists yet, right? if we're really honest with ourselves. And for many of us, we don't spend much of a time in the course of a day asking or talking to God about anything. Isn't that true? So that's my, that might be the, the average state that we have, right? Now, can you see that if, if I just engage the experiment, and what's the experiment? The experiment is longing for divine love, and seeing whether you receive it. And if you don't, trying to understand the laws that are involved why you're not receiving it. That's the experiment. And if you engage that experiment, once it happens once and you know it, 
do you think you would then have more faith or less faith in it? More, of course, wouldn't you? It's like, if I said to you, look, you can all run at that wall and you can all run straight through it. Right? And the first person who runs to that wall goes, runs to the wall, <laughs> oh, you know, like, and, and bang, you know? And that, it wasn't possible, right? So the very first person who does that is going to get what? Feedback system, knowing that it wasn't possible for them. Does that mean it's not possible? It doesn't, does it? It just means that I don't understand the laws engaged as to why that would happen. So if I'm not receiving divine love, it's exactly the same. right? So if I think I'm praying... And I, and, and I think that I've got some kind of longing for God. And, and instead what I do is I, I'm like hitting that wall and bouncing off it and nothing's really happening aside from me feeling like I'm hurt. Then I must understand that I still don't understand the law that it engages the reception of divine love. See, does that make sense? So you see, this is why it's very important for us we need to engage the desire for prayer. And when we realize that we don't get a response, then we need to know that there's something that we don't understand here. There's some kind of law that we're not getting. Because there's millions of celestial spirits who have gotten this law. So that tells us it's possible. There's plenty of other people that have done it. that tells us it's possible. So if it's possible, but we don't do it, then there's got to be something to do with our engagement of the law and our understanding personally of the law. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that a hand, Mary? It's a half a hand. It's a half a hand. <laughs> half master. Say what you want to say. What you're describing to me, it, like when everyone listens to you, I feel their faith increase. And I feel that's because they see a demonstration of something, of fact, in yourself. Mm -hmm. But that's not the real thing that grows our faith. It's, no. It's having the experience for it's ourselves. It's having the personal experience yourself. But it, it keeps occurring to me as you're talking that we can also have faith in the process of experimentation. Exactly. And this is what you're describing. A lot of us feel like faith, the experiment part is our faith, don't we? And then we... We go, oh, faith feels like I'm stepping out into the unknown and it's a big risk. From what you've said, actually, it's based on fact and that leads us to experiment, which is not faith, that's experimenting. Yes. And I can have faith that if I just keep experimenting. Yes, and experimentation is important for us to eventually gain faith because without experimenting, we will never yes. have any faith. In the we end. don't have an experience. Now. We won't have an experience. So we need to experiment. But the problem with experimenting for most of us is we are terrified of experimenting. You think about how much, how terror, how much terror you have in your day-to-day -day life of trying something new, which is an experiment. And the majority of people have huge amounts of terror involved with something new. Like, if I said to you, right, just stop for a moment. What I'm going to do now is five minutes. In five minutes' time, I will start picking out people from the audience and you've got to come up here for five minutes and explain the principles of divine truth to the audience of 200 people. How many of you would willingly and with great joy engage that experiment? Can you feel the fear? Now, I know there's some of you that might, but can you feel the fear? The fear goes... Whoa. And what does fear do? It stops you from being willing to make mistakes. And if you're willing to make mistakes, that's involved with experimenting, a willingness to make mistakes. Like, I'm willing to make thousands of mistakes. Right? I love making mistakes. <laughs> I'm serious, I do. Do you know why? Because without them, I can't find out the answers to my experiments. Right? So, uh, to me, making mistakes is a very important part of this. But you've got to be willing to make mistakes. Most of us are so unwilling to make mistakes that we don't even develop a desire to do something, even when we have a spark of faith. We go, my faith would motivate me down that track, but I'm too frightened. So I go down this track instead. That's what we do. So what we would like to do after we have a break 
is we want to talk about the relationships between, we want to talk more about faith, but this time what to have faith in. Where, what kind of things are going to help us in this, the discovery of the greatest law. Remember I said to you that this is the greatest laws. The greatest laws of the universe are the laws of divine love. They will have the biggest effect on your future existence. At the moment, most of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And that's okay. I'm just trying to encourage you to believe that, or at least have some faith, that this is the greatest law you could ever find out about. And what I'm suggesting is experiment with it. Allow yourself to do the experiment, the big experiment, which is this connection with God. Remember I said the connection with God is the thing that is going to give you all other truth. All the other facts of the universe will come to you through this connection. If you engage the connection first, that's going to be a very rapid process. If you do not engage the connection first, you know what will happen instead? What will happen instead is you'll have to do the individual step-by-step -step thing where you've got nobody telling you about what are the laws of the soul and you have to discover each one of them personally. Now, many of you are engaged in this process unwillingly. Every single moment of every single day you're engaged in the process of unwillingly experiencing the results of God's laws on the soul without wanting to know what's going on. Many people on the planet are doing that and many and most, in fact, people in the spirit world are still doing that. And what I'm suggesting is we need to change our tack, have some faith in God and start experimenting with this greatest law. So after the break, I want to talk some more about faith, what to have faith in, and, and then we'll lead it open to tomorrow with the discussion about prayer and what, you know, what, what we need to do with regard to prayer. And what we'll do now is we'll have a break for, do you like about, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes or so? Does that sound all right? And, uh, and then come back, which would make it quarter to 10 to 4. Thank you. Thanks, guys.